today we are in for a treat. Uh, today we're going to have a program by Dara Vance, a recent graduate of the University of South Florida St. Petersburg's Florida Studies program, who has also earned degrees at Eckerd College, had has attended the Savannah College of Art and Design, and has done a lot of great work in the community. For a while she was a teacher at her alma mater, Gibbs High School, and is somebody who has a lot to contribute to a very important and underrepresented chapter of Florida's history. The history of women in Florida has not been well documented when we get beyond into the 19th and 18th centuries. A lot of the diaries and materials that are available are sometimes cryptic or very difficult to transcribe. Dara attacked a, an incredible diary that has been overdue for transcription and looked at a very courageous and forthcoming woman who came to a very remote frontier who was known as Sylvia Sunshine in her book, but Abby Brooks recreated for us um, and through her diary a strong and very valuable view of what Florida looked like in the years right after the Civil War. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Dara Vance. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jim, for that introduction. First of all, I'd like to say thank you to the Pinellas County Historical Society and Heritage Village and to Jim Schnur for arranging this. Um, when I was about eight years old, sitting on the steps of the Seven Gables house in my cute little bonnet, I didn't think I'd be back here doing this um, all those many years later. So I'm really glad to be back and be talking about something that's really important to me, which is the role of women in Florida's development. And so we're going to be talking today about tourism and Florida, and specifically about the role of Abby Brooks in tourism in Florida. So tourism in Florida in the 1870s was a really limited enterprise. I'm not even sure if the word tourist was being used at the time. Transportation was unreliable and oftentimes very dangerous. The quality of accommodations could range from pristine and expensive to affordable and filthy. Bed bugs, roaches, snakes, these are all sort of very typical and frequent concerns. The idea of visiting the beach was not only laughable, but downright dangerous. Live entertainment, that was pretty much limited to visiting the circus or the itinerant preacher. So instead of visiting Miami, Naples, or Daytona, travelers often found themselves in locations such as Enterprise, Live Oak, Punta Rasa, Baldwin, or Tokoy. So one intrepid traveler of the time was Abby Brooks, author, school teacher, and tourist. She faithfully chronicled more than four years of travel throughout Florida, southern Georgia, and Cuba. Eventually, she self-published her observations in an 1886 guidebook entitled Petals Plucked from Sunny Climes. What, what a great title for a book about Florida. She wrote under the vivid pen name Sylvia Sunshine, and while the guidebook offered this really informed and useful view of Florida, her diary entries that we're gonna look at today are really what allow the reader to sort of understand the effect of Florida. So it's clear from her account that travel in the 19th century in Florida was, it really, you had to be persistent, you had to be determined, and probably a little left of center to wanna to travel. The subtext of Brooks' writing is what I like to call the Florida effect. And this I see as being sort of a infectious hypnosis. It really propelled Brooks to endure Florida's lack of hospitality in order to reap the Sunshine State's rewards. So it's that Florida effect, I believe, that has enabled the state to transition from those untamed frontiers into one of the world's most accessible and desirable tourist destinations. So to offer some perspective on how much Florida has transformed as a result of this Florida effect, I wanna share with you some of her entries on Florida. The quotes and anecdotes I'm going to share are from her 1872 diary, which I transcribed and annotated over a three year period of time. Uh, the diary is held at Duke University. It had never before been transcribed. They knew that it existed, but they didn't really know what was in it. And so um, I endeavored with the encouragement, strong encouragement of Dr. Gary Mormino to find out a little bit more about what was in that book. 
So her writings offer insight not only into the difficulty of tra traversing Florida Peninsula, but also she really expertly conveys the beauty of what she describes as being a foreign land. So I'd like to begin where she began her diary on the steamer, the Hiram H. Cool, and she's traveling from Manatee to Cedar Key in the Gulf of Mexico. We left Manatee this morning with smooth waters. We stopped at Clearwater, and at this point, as many of you probably know, Clearwater was spelled two words, clear water. We stopped at Clearwater at 1 p.m. While they were taking the mail up, three or four went on shore. The shells were nothing new to me, but I took some of them. As we were leaving, a big horseshoe crab came walking out, which is said to be a certain sign of a storm, and he was anchoring his boat. A dark, at dark, the wind commenced blowing. I began to get sick again, but I sat up in the air until 9 p.m. At 12 o'clock, Mr. Jackson opened our window, and he says, Delia, you and Miss Brooks get up and come out of there. I may have to cut that cabin away. I was much frightened and made my way with the greatest of difficulty. Mr. Jackson was holding me to keep me from blowing in the rough water. He put us in the engineer's room and shut the door. <sighs> I heard them say, the anchors are gone. It seemed the angel of death was in league with the powers of darkness and oblivion would soon be upon all of us. I prayed as I had never done before. Life preservers were brought in, and one man put one of them on. They looked a poor hope for safety. I did not want one on me. My God was all I trusted in. They asked me gravely if I could swim. I replied, no more than an iron wedge. In the cold, dark, briny waves, no swimming could have saved us. Our only hope was steam to get us up on the shore. And that engine worked while the boat spun around like a little top. The time seemed long. Oh, but the longest night always has a morning. And by four o'clock in the morning, we had finally grounded one mile from Cedar Key. So what we see here in this entry is a mix of drama, some Victorian resolve, and a little bit of humor but it also reflects the temerity and fortitude necessary for travel in the 1870s. Despite the obvious danger, Brooks persisted in her travel. In fact, she continued to sail on that particular boat. At the time, Brooks was a middle-aged woman, and she traveled alone, usually. She fancied herself to be of a little bit higher moral and social stature, so she usually complained of her traveling conditions and accommodations. And her description of a train ride to Tallahassee was really no exception. So this is the train station in Tallahassee about when she would have been arriving. I arrived at 6 p.m. by being dropped down on an immense platform upon which the moon was shining very brightly and a cool wind was blowing briskly. It is making like a pilgrimage to start from Jacksonville for Tallahassee. And the West Florida people complain about visitors thinking there is no place like the St. John's and no city but Jacksonville. Huh. However, the facilities for traveling to other parts of the state are so limited that few have the courage to undertake it. The people here do not accommodate like they do on the St. John's River. So it's not surprising that Brooks never again visited Tallahassee. In fact, with the exception of Jacksonville and Key West, Florida's modern tourist destinations were really not popular stop, stops in the 19th century. In 1872, the railroad was really a limited enterprise. It was pretty much just the northern third of the state. So we see here in purple the, um, destin the railroad lines, and then in green are what would be schooner or steamship lines. So we see Jacksonville to the east is accessible both by rail and steamship. And uh, we see that there's a line that connects over to Tallahassee and it heads south into what is St. Mark's and north up into Chassahowitzka, which was also where the state mental facility is. I don't know if there's any connection there with the legislature being in Tallahassee, but that's for another talk. Um, and then you see that there's a line that comes out of the northeast part of Florida. That's Fernandina, 
and heads down to Cedar Key. Now, during the uh, Civil War, this is uh, David Yulee's railroad. During the Civil War, this line was heavily damaged, but by the time that Abby Brooks is traveling, service had been quasi uh, restored there. So we also see this little purple line down just around St. Augustine. That was this little line called Tokoy, which was a railroad um, line that went just from the St. Johns River out to St. Augustine. So this is what Tokoy would have looked like when Abby Brooks was disembarking, and then this is what it looks like today. So the reason, though, for that little tiny uh, rail line was because there was a sandbar off the coast of St. Augustine that was extremely dangerous to try and cross with steamships. So it was actually preferable to get on a steamship, come down the St. Johns River, and take the railroad sort of the back way to St. Augustine. So if you wanted to go much further south than, say, St. Augustine or Cedar Key, you really had to rely heavily on steamships because the rail lines had just not been expanded. So what we see here are the areas that Abbey Brooks visited. And they're concentrated around the rail lines and around the steamship lines. And so she visited a lot of places that are sort of off the beaten path today. So when we look at today's population centers, this is a map from 2000. And so when we look at those population centers, what we end up seeing is that they follow roughly the interstates, which roughly follow the rail lines. So if we overlay popular tourist destinations now with where she visited, what we're seeing is that the tourist destinations have expanded off away from where she was traveling and into either the lower east coast of the state or into the central part of the state. So what we are able to see with her reflections, though, are some descriptions of places that are sort of off the beaten path, and even today are sort of off the beaten path. So this is Fernandina, Florida. This is about as far northeast as you can go in the state of Florida. It's right across the St. Mary's River from Georgia. It's where uh, Fort Clinch is located, if any Civil War buffs are here. So we see Center Street, we see the wharf with a steamship dock there, and we see the railroad depot. And then today, this is what Fernandina looks like. Not a whole lot different. So it's still off the beaten path. If you haven't had an opportunity to visit Fernandina, I highly recommend going up there and seeing what it looks like. So Fernandina would have been a frequent stop for her. What was not a frequent stop? Miami. In 1872, there was no Miami. There was a settlement sprinkled along the Miami River. It would eventually become Lemon City, but there was no Miami. This is more than 20 years before Flagler is bringing his railroad down the East Coast. Downtown Orlando had not yet been imagined like we know it today. This, this is downtown Orlando with all the gentlemen and their alligator. God only knows where they got that from. So Central Florida at this point is really just a farming community, ranching community. Even citrus was really not a bumper crop at this point. Now you might say, well, what about Tampa? I know she came to Tampa. Well, she did come to Tampa. But in the 1870s, Tampa was a really flagging port town. It had a population of about 700 people, and it was recovering from a yellow fever outbreak. So here's the docks in Tampa. Everybody's come out to greet the steamship. And this is the southwest corner of Lafayette Street and Florida Avenue. You might say, Lafayette Street and Florida Avenue, where's that? Well, Lafayette Street is now Kennedy Boulevard, and this is what that looks like now. So this is her description of Tampa. 40 miles from Manatee is to be seen the remains of Tampa. See, she already has it in for the town. Your morning slumber here will not be interrupted by the hammers of workmen. Old Tampa, many years ago, was considered a famous resort for conceptives. Persons advanced in life from all parts now speak in glowing terms of the uniform temperature of its atmosphere. But indifferent houses of entertainment charging exorbitant rates will soon ruin the popularity of this place. We do not take leave of this place as we do of a dear friend. It is, it's deep, sandy sidewalks are things but uninviting for the promenaders. The de decaying structures and dilapidated fences remind us all of old age. 
the place looks discouraged from this sheer weariness in trying to be a town. So again, her visit is well before Henry Plant's Tampa Bay Hotel, which opened in 1891. Given her poor evaluation, again, she didn't come back. So in stark contrast, though, we have her description of Key West. In fact, her details of the bustling island um, are a really rich vignette of time and place. It actually sounds a lot more like modern Miami. The wharf is a busy place here. Vessels from various ports with the ensigns of different nationalities, schooners and sloops from 10 to 1,000 tons, loaded principally with edibles and lumber. To a person who has never visited this island, it is almost impossible to imagine that only 64 miles from the mainland of Florida is a city in appearance so nearly resembling the Spanish dominions of the old world where hardly a word of English is heard. Business transactions conducted in a foreign language, produce bought and sold together with fruits from the tropics cried in Spanish by the auctioneers. The chief of the Seminoles is among the traders from his Everglades home, inhabited by the deer. Tiger Tail, the ruler of his tribe, has come with sweet potatoes, cabbage, venison, honey, and buckskin. And there are but few vehicles here. Pedestrians walk in the center of the street. <laughs> but nearly all the ladies go without any covering on their heads, walking about in the golden sunshine, regardless of its, con of its consequences on their complexions. There is but little shade here. In summation of her nighttime sails, Brooks writes about Key West. When far from the habitations of humanity associated with all that is pure and beautiful, the canopied heavens above us, open their angel eyes with night spread over us, and the boundless waters are beneath us. We feel elevated and our souls purified by communing with what is grand and sublime. So it's pretty clear Florida has cast a spell over Abbey Brooks. And as is typical for a lot of Key West tourists, with every sunset, she felt reality sort of ebb away a little bit more. Now, in stark contrast to those sublime vistas in Key West, Brooks' uh, days as a traveler were often punctuated by poor lodging conditions and very tenuous travel arrangements. It is her observations, though, of the local town folks that really offer the sense of colorful Florida and the rough hewn edges. So the following is her opinion of Lake City, and um, it, Lake City, which was a very frequent railroad stop. Today, Lake City is sort of that city up there, but at the time, it was a very frequent and busy railroad stop between Jacksonville and Tallahassee. So she's commenting about a day when they're going to be having some picnicking going on. So here's the Lake City depot and a uh, picnic party assembled in Lake City. And if, I don't know if you can see in this picture or not, but just about every guy in that picture has a gun. <laughs> At an early hour this morning, Lake City seemed alive with people. The cars came in crowded with those bent on sightseeing. Now remember, when she says cars, she was, is referring to the railroad, not automobiles. The cars came in with those crowded with those bent on sightseeing. They brought well-filled baskets containing their breakfast as a wise precaution against the coming hunger. Babies gave many an impromptu performance, the conclusion of each act being more satisfactory than the commencement. One of those babies was named Shakespeare, which, like its illustrious namesake, made a very big noise. History has recorded no such combination of sounds as were pr produced from infantile humanity. Mrs. Noah had no concert on the ark to which this was a comparison. So any romantic notion that one may have had about rustic Florida travel is really quickly dispelled by her description of the food and the lodging that she endured. One of the most delightful entries is her encounter with a hotel pest that's really made a modern day comeback, bedbugs. They were every size from the least, which looked as though he had been on a forced march without rations for a month, for, to the plumpest red coat in the number. I made an attack and I destroyed the first army with a precipitate thrust down the lamp chimney. 
Thinking the foe had been vanquished, I retired, but reinforcements soon filled their places. Some came to bring the dead, others to carry off the wounded, while the balance revived the fight. In a fit of desperation, I sprinkled kerosene on the bed as an exterminator. Huh. But this produced an exhilarating effect and increased their numbers. There was no help or escape from them until the day dawned, which revealed many carcasses of the slain. I arose weak and weary from my night and descended to the sitting room for a respite. But on taking up the newspaper, I found a bed bug looking over the correspondence column. <laughs> In additional entries, Brooks describes roaches in her coffee on a sail to Cuba. She worried about encountering a cotton mouth in Jacksonville. She, in St. Augustine, she was unceremoniously evicted from her room until she showed the proprietor her bank statement to prove she could actually pay for it. During a stay in Savannah, the house next door burned down. During a steamship voyage in Fernandina, the captain died and was thrown overboard. And in Cedar Key, she disembarked to find the island in the midst of a yellow fever epidemic. So while working on her transcription, uh, the transcription of the diary, it's about this point that I find myself wondering, why doesn't she just stay home? So I realized that like a lot of people who transplant themselves to Florida, Abby Brooks really had no true home. In the 1850s, she left Pennsylvania. She was in her mid to late 20s at this time. And there were rumors of an out of wedlock pregnancy and a failed marriage. Um, so she left potentially under some family shame. During the Civil War, she taught school throughout the South. She lived in Atlanta for a time. She lived in Tennessee. Uh, she sort of eventually settled into this typical snowbird routine where she would um, be in Tennessee during the um, warmer months and then come down to Florida October through May. So Brooks really felt at home on the unpredictable and untamed frontier of Florida. Her description of Jacksonville really offers some great insight into why she returned to the Sunshine State year after year. Everything here is moving briskly, and it seems so good to return to the land of churches, Bibles, and Christians again. I can go away in a rude place for a while, but I soon tire of it. I cannot stay away with those who contend to live away from God and society. Okay, now Floridians today would probably be hard pressed to describe Jacksonville and her stevedores and naval sailors and strip clubs and insurance salesmen as being a real bastion of piety. But clearly, Brooks believed that all of Florida was her solace in a storm of greed, opportunism, rough culture, that was really permeating the post-bellum South. She had really succumbed to the lure of Florida's siren song, which promised to renew your identity and erase your past transgressions. She was way ahead of the modern identity of Florida when she observed the following. There are many here who feel the downy flapping of the wings of the unrelenting destroyer, and they either try to cheat him or take a new lease on life by traveling. So Abby was compelled to travel. She had a curiosity that was really only limited by her expanding sense of independence. Her intent was to gather knowledge and develop an understanding of both place and self. And despite being a poor sailor who suffered from mal de mar, she endeavored to sail from Pensacola all the way to Cuba. And this is what she had to say about why she went. I feel as though sailing to Cuba was a favorable opportunity for indulgence of a spirit of adventure and to add to my knowledge of this portion of the country. I love to go away and see the sights which are in the world, and I love to come back, and I can rest and digest what I have seen during my absence. A winter in this Florida climate is worth years in that torpid state which the old dreary winters bring in the north. So it's no wonder, with views like this, why Brooks kept coming back to Florida. She really felt that it was restorative, that it was healing 
for her to be here in Florida. So it's Brooke's visits, though, to the greater Tampa Bay area that I think best ro illustrate her romance with Florida. She found the Gulf Coast a, real, a true veritable paradise of climate, environment, and food. During her Bay Area visits, she frequently stayed at the property of Madame Jo. Now, Madame Jo lived in Terracia. This is Madame Jo on her 80th birthday, and then this is Madame Jo in her, um, out in her garden. Madame Jo was Julia uh, Atzeroth. The Atzeroth lived on Terracia, which is just south of the Sunshine Skyway Bridge, just north of the Manatee River, around near the city of Bradenton. Julia and her husband, Joe, immigrated from Bavaria in the 1830s to 1840s. By the 1840s, they'd settled in Terracia, and they were really the first to settle the island. Madame Joe is often credited as being the first person in the United States to grow coffee. She traded with um, a settler from Mexico, and she grew coffee, which flourished on the Terracia Island. She also grew tobacco which was, again, a very flourishing crop. She actually, um, her husband fought in the Civil War, and she stayed home and planted these crops and actually ran a pretty successful business and was a, a, a sort of an independent businesswoman at the time. In the 1870s, Bradenton and Manatee were both bustling steamship ports. They were, had lumber mills. There was agriculture production, fisheries, uh, tourist hotels. So it was a real sort of center of activity, a hub of activity. So when she writes about the area, she usually has glowing praise for it. And Terracia, her entry on Terracia, really conveys the level to which she was captivated by Florida as a paradise. Madame Joe's land fronts on the bay, a clear, beautiful sheet of water, while her yard reminds one of an enchanted land. You feel constantly as though you are having a beautiful dream from which you might be severed by an external diversion and the spell forever broken. Here, nature reveals her glories. Her face is adorned with gay attire, while the frozen north lies wrapped in wintry gloom. Golden fruits hang from the trees, now in luxuriant loveliness, filled with nectarine juice to delight and, and refresh all those who pluck and taste. I have heard of many beautiful places, but for this location, it excels all in every way. So the Atzeroth property would continue to be a frequent destination for Abby Brooks, and she remarks often about its abundance of vegetation and game. Now, this is an image of Terracia. I actually think it was busier then than it is now. Um, this would have been downtown Terracia. The Hubbard store is there. The Gates uh, store is there. There's a post office. Um, Josiah Gates was a settler in the area. We'll hear later about her stay with the Gates uh, family. So when she would visit, she would uh, visit not only Bradenton, but the surrounding area as well. She would collect shells, she would attend church, she'd visit with the locals, take day trips to the sawmills and the oyster flats. And she often visited Palmetto just across the river. So this is the Palmetto dock. This is what it looks like now. This is also a location where the Atzeroth, Madame Jo, had built a uh, sort of a cabin or a cottage, and she also had a store there, which is in the approximate location of the picture in the lower left-hand corner. Uh, now there's a bed and breakfast and a condominium on that site, but that's about where Abby Brooks may have been visiting. So often her excursions to the Oyster Flats, though, concluded with her having to get out and push the skiff along because now it's low tide and she can't ride the boat anymore. And so clearly, this idea of modern, convenient, traversable, homogenized Florida is a long way off. So because she did spend so much time there in Manatee, I do want to talk a little more in depth about her repeated visits. Um, it's not only about the area that she talked, but also about the people. So we get a really great sense of the people and the places in the Bradenton Manatee area from that time. So, my very first entry I read to you as she's on the Hiram H. Cool was from 1872. And she's actually sailing away from Manatee 
and up to Cedar Key at that point. So now, a year later, she finally returns. She's been traveling for a year, and she finally returns. And what she notes is that there's more than 50 people that have come down to the dock to greet the steamer. So clearly, the arrival of the steamer, potential visitors, hotel guests, the mail, supplies, this is big news. So everybody rushes down to the dock to greet the steamer. And she takes up a room with Mrs. Gates, the widow of Josiah Gates, who I just mentioned. Josiah Gates was one of the founders of the area. He founded the village of Manatee, which was considered to be a separate town until about 1945. Then it sort of got engulfed into the greater Bradenton area. But it was just to the east of Bradenton on a small inlet in the river. And that, the Gates had founded that. So it's possible that's where she was staying, was over in that village of Manatee. So she's visiting in February of 1873. And as we know, February and March can produce amazing weather here in the Tampa Bay area, and she notes as such. Nothing disturbs the monotony here but restless rolling waves upon which ride the crustaceous inhabitants. The yard is filled with green orange trees hanging with fruit. The sea and her gentle cadence are subdued by the soft winds to the louder, deeper roaring. With sunny skies and fleecy clouds flecking the horizon, the air floats with gentleness while a dreamy state of enchantment keeps you spellbound with the witchery of some magic influence. There is no counterfeit here in sunlight which pervades the land. I have seen limes growing today and enjoyed plucking them. So during her stays there, she got to know a lot of people and she would stay with them year after year and they would serve as her sort of impromptu tour guides. And so one of the families that she befriended was the Patton family. And so she speaks of going sailing with Major Patton, who is Major George Patton. This is him. And he came to the Bradenton Manatee area um, after losing his property in Savannah during the Civil War. He had a, a, a cotton business and some property in Savannah, and he lost all of that during the Civil War. So he came down to Manatee. And he purchased the Gamble Mansion and about 3,500 acres for $3,000, which was probably, uh, now it is, seems insane, but then it was probably a sizable sum of money. So he plotted out that land and he gave some acreage to each, each of his children. He had 13 children. And so he named the resulting settlement for his oldest daughter, Ellen, which is now Ellenton. And so she was befriending them and staying with them right about at this time. So one of the areas he took her to was here, what's known as Point Pleasant. It was also known as Curry's Point, the Curry family being prominent in the area, and then also renamed Point Pleasant. So it appears that it was on the Bradenton side of the river, just south now of what is downtown. And uh, she didn't think much of the area. She thought it was a sandy, barren place. They just weren't going to be able to plant anything or have a go of it. However, the greater Bradenton and Manatee area, she really found charming. She knew it was a rural lifestyle, but she enjoyed it. In fact, she even sort of prided herself on her tolerance of the area, as this next quote will, will show you. In Manatee, all the people dress plainly. The arranging of hair to decorate or display their charms more fully is something which the primitive position of the residences does not require. The houses display no architectural skill, but much tact in the adaptation to their necessity for shelter. Each room is filled with living humanity, but they are always politely to ask you to stay with them. Although your inventive powers would be exercised to know where you are going to sleep, a visitor from the refined walks of life would feel like a newly created thing in this environment. They would be introduced into a new world of existence. Everything is tinged with novelty here, which lasts according to the disposition or inclination of its possessor. Some are fond of rural life and the rural life which surrounds them, furnish them with amusements, while another person would lose their temper and be absolutely impaired with disgust. 
So she really fancied herself to be fitting in well with the locals. Whether or not that's true remains to be seen, but she truly enjoyed visiting Manatee and getting to know the people there. During one of her visits, she befriended the lighthouse keeper for Egmont Key. His name was Captain William Coons, and he sailed her out to Egmont Key for a visit. Now, if you look here where Bradenton is, right about where 41 goes across, Palmetto's over here, Terracea is up there in the bay, and Egmont Key is that island just there between Fort DeSoto and Anna Maria Island. It was a 14-hour sail. They relied solely on the wind to get them there. Unfortunately for them, the wind was slack that day, so they relied mainly on the tide to kind of drift in the general direction of Egmont Key. It was actually an overnight sail. After seven hours, they encountered a government schooner, and they hailed the schooner. They were invited to spend the night on board with uh, the schooner party, which was a good thing, because otherwise they would have been on the deck of the sailboat all night. Uh, the schooner was actually on a lengthy mission. Um, the schooner was on a government mission to chart and sound the entire coast of Florida. In fact, that particular schooner is largely responsible for the navigation maps for Char uh, Charlotte Harbor and the Florida Keys. So again, kind of interesting that she happened to be in the right place at the right time to encounter this government schooner. So they finally get to Egmont Key, and she spends about a week there which is understandable since it took her so long to get there. And her descriptions of the area, again, are just really glowing. The growth of this island is cabbage palms, mangroves, Jerusalem oaks, hogweed cactus lantana, palma crista, all of which are spontaneous. And at a distance, it presents very beautiful appearance to the traveler who comes from an icy climb. The waterfowls are flying about in countless numbers, porting to the air, dancing on the water, either for pleasure or for food. And no part of the world has a greater variety of the finny tribe than this coast. Sharks of 16 to 18 feet in length, devilfish of enormous size, jewfish weighing over three or 400 pounds, tarpon of 150 to 200 pounds are quite common. School of mullet swim in these waters, constituting an article of commerce. Here the ocean birds come to build their nest or plume their pinions for longer flights. The most frequent sounds are from the sighing winds and the heavy seas, but the weather is calm. So as clear again, Egmont Key really romanced her as well. Now what I've admitted here from her description is that she became quite ill when she was on Egmont Key. Her initial symptoms passed, but for several months afterwards in her diary, she complains of fever, chills, general malaise, fatigue. She really sees this as just sort of having a lingering cold. After she leaves Egmont and Manatee, she travels up to Atlanta and she convalesces for pretty much the rest of the summer. And she thinks, oh, I just have a really bad cold. I think it's much more likely that she contracted some sort of mosquito-borne disease and had a, a lingering fever. Um, mos mosquitoes were a major factor in really preventing the development of the beach, and especially in those tidal areas where they were more marshy. And it wasn't really until the invention of chemical eradication of mosquitoes that those areas could be safely developed. But finally, towards the end of the summer, she feels well enough to start her travels again. Now, for the next 30 years, Abby Brooks travels extensively. She manages to arrange her schedule to be in the right place at the right time. So she travels to Cuba during the 10 Years' War. That was her sail from Pensacola down to Cuba. It's during the 10 Years' War. She tells stories of seeing slavery in action. She tells stories of port security and barely making it into the port of Cuba. In fact, she lies, says that she's, uh, she's the hired help on the boat because she doesn't have any papers to go there. So she tells them, I'm the hired help on the boat. And so she gets into Cuba. Um, she arranges to be in Philadelphia for the 1876 centennial. She meets with railroad and steamship magnates, land barons, judges, senators, preachers. She really focuses her time on gathering information about the people and the places that she visited. And that was all in an effort to publish her book. 
So this is the cover of her book and sort of that very first page of it. And it was self-published. She, this was so important to her that she decided, I'm going to publish the book myself. And it's over 500 pages. It is an enormous volume. And it tells you an incredible amount of information about Florida and Florida history as she saw it in the 1870s. However, the book was really not widely received at the time. What's interesting, though, is that in a book series, a centennial book series in uh, 1976, the state of Florida republished her book. And it had a nice introduction to it. And a little more notice was given to her at the time. However, people still really didn't know who she was because she had written under the pen name Sylvia Sunshine. People hadn't really put two and two together and realized that Sylvia Sunshine and Abby Brooks were the same person. So even though today a lot of people still really don't know very much about Abby Brooks, Sylvia Sunshine, Florida scholars do see her book as being a really important chronicle of tourism and also of Florida's really early sort of inhospitable days. Now after that 1886 publication, she continued to write and she continued to do research and she continued to travel. She more or less settled permanently in St. Augustine. She wrote an occasional column for the uh, Jacksonville Courier and the St. Augustine Record. And St. Augustine pretty much became a home for her as much as anywhere. Court records show that she owned property there. She even owned the oldest house for a while. So it was probably her time there in St. Augustine that influenced her interest in Spanish history. So in the early 1890s, Abby Brooks endeavored to sail to Spain to do research in the Spanish archives. This is her passport application. She lied about her age. She would have been 60 at the time. She probably thought that was a little old to be traveling by herself, so she lied, said she's a little younger. And she um, got her passport. She traveled on this ship. This was a French-built ship that um, sailed out of New York. So she obviously made her way to New York and then sailed to Europe. And she spent several months in the Spanish archives. And she made several trips over there. There's a, a diary of her travels that's in the St. Augustine Historical Society archives. And she's transcribing and translating the Spanish history of St. Augustine. Again, a mammoth volume. She speaks very little Spanish at this point. I can tell in her diary she's trying to learn, but she's really struggling. She speaks French, but she doesn't speak very much Spanish. So she has to rely on a translator. And she comes back, again, self-publishes this mammoth volume even donates a copy to the National Archives in DC. So this is where, again, she doesn't have much luck. The National Archives don't see a lot of value in her transcription or translation of the Spanish history of Florida. Copies of it still exist. You can access it digitally. You can, it was called the Unwritten History of Spanish, the Unwritten Spanish History of St. Augustine. You can Google it. You can find digital copies of it. However, because there was not much value placed on the um, information in it, the original that she donated has actually been destroyed during a purge of documents. So it no longer exists. We have the digital copies and transcriptions of it, but that's all that exists. So she really didn't have much success as an author at her, during her lifetime. Now, anecdotally, I do want to note for those of you who visited the oldest house, and like I said, she owned it for a while. This brass door knocker used to be on the door. I don't think it still is anymore. I think they took it down and put it on display. Um, she brought that back from Spain. She had gone to, during her trip to Spain, she had um, sort of contracted with a gentleman in St. Augustine to bring back some items. The door knocker being one that was put on the door of the house, some furniture, some other items. And the reason that I know that this happened is because the gentleman never paid her, and so she sued him. And so the lawsuit, and she did emerge victorious from the lawsuit, the lawsuit is, again, in the St. Augustine um, archives. She, interestingly enough, was very litigious. She sued a lot of people. She was very much interested in making sure that justice was served to her. And so, again, another reason that I know about her property ownership in St. Augustine is because of lawsuits that she had engaged in at that time. So she comes back to America. 
And now she's quite aged. She was born in 1831. So now at the turn of the century, she's getting on in years. She's never been in good health. Throughout all of her diaries, all she does is complain about her health and, how, and what poor health she is. So I'm amazed that she's lived this long. So she finishes out her days in St. Augustine. And in fact, the last place that she lives in St. Augustine is in this house on Water Street. Now, I don't think she'd approve of the paint job today. But this is a beautiful house on Water Street. In fact, I call it the loud mouth of the block because there's all these beautiful stately homes and then there's this hot pink house. But it's this beautiful house with a view right across the marsh in St. Augustine. So it must have been a wonderful place for her to spend the rest of her days. She lived here with friend and caretaker. Um, again, she died relatively penniless. And so she uh, passed away in this home and was buried in St. Augustine. But again, because she was penniless, she was buried in an unmarked grave. And it remained unmarked until about 10 years ago. Um, a couple from the east coast of Florida that are amateur historians uh, named Dick and Yvonne uh, Punnett, they were doing research about her and wanted to, again, know who was this Sylvia Sunshine? Who was this woman? They found out she was buried in the Evergreen Cemetery. Through cemetery records, they located her grave. They actually contacted descendants. So her great, great grandchildren were contacted and they actually came to St. Augustine and they laid a headstone at her grave. So uh, it's nice that she finally got some recognition and on the gravestone they put that she's you know, Florida author and historian. So nice that she finally got her recognition. So <clears throat> Abby Brooks offers us this really complex and detailed glimpse into Florida's tourist trade. But it also offers us some insight into the building momentum of the women's movement. Brooks had a failed marriage early in life. She never married again. She traveled and wrote and lived independently, and she really had very little use for men other than to maybe tote her bags or kill some unwanted beast. So her early diary entries from the 1860s, which I have a copy of uh, here, are really full of grief and self-pity um, for all these failures that she sees in her life. Her failure as a wife and as a dutiful daughter and as a potential mother and uh, her failure as not being a very diligent school teacher. I, she really didn't like her students very much. So after the Civil War, she starts traveling and she starts to develop sort of this bigger sense of herself and her place. And I think a lot of what she's seeing is she's seeing other women who are suffering greatly. They've lost children, they've lost husbands, they've lost property in the war, and these women are somehow finding the strength to go on. So she sort of picks herself up and dusts herself off and starts traveling and travels to Florida. And it seems that the more time that she spends in Florida during Reconstruction, the more that she herself is reconstructed. And so even though she's faced with continual difficulty and potential danger at every turn in the road, she really found liberation here on the Florida frontier. Because again, in Florida in the 1870s during Reconstruction, you could be whoever or whatever you said you were. It was really wide open to just reinvent yourself. And Florida largely is still that way. People come here frequently to retire, to start a new life, to just sort of be what they want to be. And she was no different in observing this. And sort of in summation of her days in Florida, she says, I think there are now as many days of sunshine with me as most persons in the world. My travel in Florida and Cuba were an uninterrupted source of pleasure and entertainment, made thus by the smiles of friendship among kind-hearted people, combined with the luscious fruits and delightful scenery by which I am most constantly surrounded." So late 19th century Florida really rewarded Brooks' persistence with perpetual inspiration and an unmitigated beauty. But I do believe there was something more at work than just mere tropical splendor and a curious folklore. I really think that the Florida effect had begun, and I think that that's what she discovered. When she came here, Abby Brooks discovered that unidentifiable something that's continued to draw people here ever since. Thank you. So I really sort of 
scraped the surface with Abby Brooks and with her travels in Florida. As I said, she wrote a 500-page book. And so I'm sure there's questions about her, about her travels. And so at this point, I would love to answer more questions and tell you more about Abby Brooks. So yes. Uh, sort of two-part question. One, I guess I can work the number back. Approximately how old was she when you started traveling? You know? She was born in 1831. So at this point in her diary, the 1872 diary, she's in her early 40s. So um, I sort of take it very personally because I'm turning 40 this year. And so I sort of feel this very personal connection with her that you know we're both sort of at this, at this similar point in our lives. So. Well, what does she do for income? How does she pull this Very off? good question. Um, at the start of my research, and again, this is, this is all Dr. Marmino's fault. Um, in the Florida Studies program, he, my very first class, I think it might have even been one of the first classes, he hands me petals plucked and he said, nobody knows who Sylvia Sunshine is. See what you can find out. Okay, great. I'm going to do this. So I really got interested and it just kept growing. And so one of the questions about her past is, did she truly have an out of wedlock pregnancy? Did she truly have a failed marriage? So there is some evidence that she did, not really anything conclusive. So I'm not sure about her relationship with her father. Her father was extremely wealthy. He ran a wool carding mill in Vermont. He moved to Meadville, Pennsylvania, where he continued to run a wool carding mill, sold that mill, and just was incredibly wealthy. However, he didn't leave that wealth to Abby. They had a falling out, and she was essentially written out of his will. Um, she was written out of his will, though, not for personal reasons, but because a third party got involved in his will and essentially wrote everyone out and had the money go to the church. So um, it wasn't necessarily for personal reasons that she didn't receive an inheritance. I do find very occasional notations of her saying that her father sent her a check and her Aunt Phoebe sent her money. So it seems like her father might be supporting her, which is, again, why I'm a little dubious about this idea that she had an out-of-wedlock pregnancy and was dis disowned by her family, because I, I just don't know if a, a, her father was also highly religious. So I'm not sure if a highly religious father would continue monetarily supporting a daughter that he had disowned. So I think her father supported her. But I think also she wrote. I think she, she published some, some newspaper articles um, in her earlier diary, she tried to be a school teacher. She tried to sell books door to door and was really bad at it. Um, she had a really good day in Savannah and sold $28 worth of books. And that was about it. You know, she really wasn't very good at that sort of stuff. So she made her living mainly from either writing or support from her relatives. So, and there was a question over here? Same question. Okay. So. What year did she die? She died in 1914. 1914? Yes. So the, the centennial of her death is next year. Uh, is the book still, in, well, I know it's not in print, but is it a, an extremely rare book now? Or? The diary that, from which I read from? The diary? No, no her, uh, the petals. Petals what? plucked? Yeah. Um, I think you can buy it. Um, it's also in numerous libraries. It's something that you could purchase. Oh, yeah. Um, my goal, however, is to try and get her diary published because Petals Plucked, again, is not written in her personal voice. It's written in her pen voice, if you will. It's written by Sylvia Sunshine. It's not written by Abby Brooks. She develops this sort of very um, affected personality in her uh, book where she becomes an authority and she, as you can uh, hear somewhat, in very flowery language. And what I read you here is probably about 30% of the um, sort of elaborate language that she uses. So if you layer many more layers of vocabulary and nuances on top of that, that's how she's writing as Sylvia Sunshine. So again, it's a really great look at time and place and her. But what I'd like to do is try and get her diary published because it's written from a much more straightforward perspective. And she makes commentary, very personal commentary, about people she visits. 
She talks about their drinking habits. She talks about their marital relationships. I mean, she's staying in the house with a lot of these people. So we get some really interesting personal looks at people that probably are sort of in between the pages of the history book. One last one. Yes. She read much about Cuba. She did. Is that in petals? Um, there is some of it in petals, but again, what we see in her diary is her personal experience there, being interrogated by the, the port security, um, talking about uh, slavery. She goes to church, um, her experience in church, things like that. So what we see in um, Petals Plucked is a little more official version of history, you know, sort of the quote unquote historical account. The things that you want to say out loud when you know that they're going for publication. What we see in her diary is what she did not intend for publication, you know? So to me, it's a, a much more juicy read, so. Her diary is the one that's at Duke? Her diary is, yes, it's in the Rubenstein Rare Book Room at Duke University. And so it's, um, my goal, it, that was my master's thesis was a transcription of it. My goal would be publication in some sort as a centennial of her death, so. Of her, there is one. There is one known photo of her, which uh, the St. Augustine Historical Society has um, a copy of, and I brought this one along. Um, I have it up here if you guys want to come up and look at it. Um, the only way that I know that that is her is because the Historical Society says that whoever gave it to him said it was her. So I always hesitate to include that in information about her because I don't really know that that is her. So in a way, I don't really know what she looked like. Um, I was just telling Jim that in going through some of the photographs from the Manatee County um, Digital Archives, they have photographs of unidentified women on Egmont Key the year that she was there. And I thought, oh gosh, wouldn't that be great if that was her? But I really have no way of knowing that that was her. And in some ways, I kind of like it that I don't really know what she looked like, because then she could look like whatever. So, but yes, I would love to find other diaries that talk about meeting her. Because I'm sure since she's meeting with judges and senators and preachers and their wives, somebody probably said Miss Brooks came over for dinner. She, she must have some form, uh, some following by the time she hit these towns for this single woman that to meet with these people. What she did, she was very active in the church. And so she would have letters of introduction from the church, and that would be her conduit into. So she had, she references having a letter of introduction from her church in Edgefield, Tennessee. And then she would use that to get to, into the, to join the church in whatever area she was in. And so then that was sort of her conduit into society. So, was that a, a, a passport application that you showed? Yes. Because it had a pretty elaborate description of her appearance. It did. Um, it has a fairly elaborate but vague description, which is that um, she was 55 years old, which is a lie. She was five foot tall. She had an oval forehead, blue eyes. Um, she had a straight mouth. <laughs> She had a narrowed chin, her hair was gray, her complexion was blonde, and her face was oblong. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, put out an APB on that one. So, Jim. Dara, uh, did you have any challenges when you were transcribing the diaries? How good was the quality of the diaries that you had to work off of? Um, well, <clears throat> this gives you a good idea of a document that was meant to be read, again, by someone else. So you can see the quality of the handwriting and the quality of the document that you're reading. So imagine the quality of a document that potentially is not meant to be read again. So what we have is a um, copy of her diary. This is the quote that I just opened my lecture with. So up at the very top, believe it or not, it says, steamer Hiram H. Cool, Florida, Gulf of Mexico, March 1st, 1872. That's the first two lines of text up there. 
And then it goes on and describes that steamer ride that I told you. This is a, um, this is a PDF printout from a microfilm of that diary that I got from University of Florida. I think I renewed my glasses prescription a couple times. Um, this is largely what I worked on for about a year and a half. At the conclusion of that, I had um, probably about 40 pages throughout the diary. I couldn't complete the transcription, this being the biggest page that I couldn't complete the transcription. So I actually had to fly to Duke and look at the diary. And I only had about collectively over a weekend, about 16 hours that I could spend with the diary. And so I had to go through the entire diary and correct my transcription. And so um, when I say I spent about three years, about two of those years was looking at this. And then the rest of my time was doing a process of annotation, which is then all these people that she mentions, I then had to find out who they were. I didn't know who the Gates were when I started. I didn't know who Major Patton was when I started. So then I had to go through and find out who are these people that she's talking about. So, yes. I just want to say I've, I've read the book. It's, it's very interesting. I find, and the Centennial version is fairly available. In fact, yes. I tell the gentleman there. I thought I saw a copy just recently at Dora Lynn Books on Madeira Way down at Madeira Beach. You know? Yes. And I have the written the you know the eighteen seventy. And I think I don't think I paid much for that, but I bought it you know a few years ago. But it is well worth reading. It is. Um, the St. Augustine Historical Society um, also has periodic book sales. Um, they have an extensive book collection. Um, I saw one there for sale. I should have bought it. Um, so, you know, they're, they're around. You can get them. I think you can order them. I don't know if it's still in print, but um, I know you can check it out from the library. The one at the library at USF actually has a little map inside, so it's, um, it's still available in print. Um, any of the pencil marks that are in it, I don't know anything about that. <laughs> so. Well, Dara, it's been a pleasure. And for your attendance and participation, we have a copy of our Centennial book. Oh, for you. excellent. And thanks, Thank and you. we hope to see you all next week. Thank you. Thank you.